All right. Hello, Magic is Real listeners and family. Thank you so much for being here today. I am Shannon Torrance. I am a psychic medium, and I am here today with the wonderful Lee Papa, who is an avid spiritual seeker and an internationally admired speaker, trainer, coach, and author, celebrated for her expertise in mindfulness and well being. In 2008, Lee went through a transformation by way of an otherworldly journey known as a near-death experience, she was gifted a peek into the into a realm that was more real than what we call life. The once stressful, drama-filled, and illness-ridden existence gave way to a spiritual understanding of the purpose of our lives and a roadmap to living mindfully. Lee, thank you so much for being here today. I'm so happy to have you. And it is my pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Oh, such a pleasure. So I would love to start by you telling us a bit about your work. And what and what you do in the realm of mindfulness and how you help your clients, et cetera, whatever you'd like to share. Sure, thank you. Um, well, my current incarnation of the work that I do, um, the, I'm going to just start with saying the umbrella is I am through the grace of God, I am able to support um, individuals and groups uh, ease suffering through mindfulness techniques, through coaching, through energy work, depending on uh, whether I'm doing private coaching or if I'm doing groups. Um, I am an author. I uh, have written uh, the, the latest book, <laughs> uh, Temple of All Knowing, which is about my near-death experience, and um, A Year of Mindfulness for Beginners. I have created meditation CDs and, um, and tracks. Uh, basically, I create content that supports the platform of, of uh, helping empower humanity through this extraordinary time in our history and move past and through suffering into empowerment and peace and well-being and love and joy. You couldn't have said that any more beautifully. Oh, thanks. That, that, was, that was wonderful. Thank you. And obviously you came into this work because you, I, I, I don't know if it, would you say it was solely because of your near-death experience that you were led here, or did you already have an interest in spirituality before your near-death experience? That's a great question. I did. Um, I would say that I've been a spiritual seeker um, since my teens, if not 20s. Um, really more, more deeply into my twenties. I've always been a spiritual seeker. I think my first memory was, um, I know it is, was in the womb. Um, so I, I've always known that there was something else and have always wanted to make known the unknown. Like, you know, in the wizard of Oz, I want to pull back the, the curtain, right? I want to, I want to see everything. Uh, so I've always been like that, but uh, doing it as work, uh, never, never a, even glimpse of that. Uh, these were always just kind of two separate lives. <laughs> yeah. And um, and so definitely since the near-death experience and, and then after all the guidance, the uh, non-physical guidance that came with that, that was, that was when it was, yes. Now, uh, there was some experiences that I had prior to the near-death experience that were kind of drip feeding me. And I didn't really realize it until after the near-death experience uh, that gave me uh, some confirmation that this was the work that I, I am to do. I was literally about to ask you that because I felt that too intuitively, but also from speaking with other near-death experiencers that there are always little clues before it happened. Not always, but a lot of times the near-death experience is like, okay, we gave you some clues. You didn't pick them up. So now we're going to shoot you to the other right. si side so that you can get what we're trying to tell you. So I kind of had that feeling and I was going to ask if you'd had other spiritual experiences before this happened. I think we all have, but um, that, that are, are there any that stand out or was it just things that you can kind of put together in hindsight? Oh no, many that stand out. Uh, uh, and I don't want to give all the details in the book because there's, it's- Yeah, yeah, of course. You know, but but I will tell you this one. Um, I had an out-of-body experience during a Reiki session. Wow. And 
I felt my spirit lift out my body and I was like, what is happening now? (laughs) And there was no fear, but I could feel it. And then I kind of sucked myself back in and I'm like, wow, this is now, this was my first Reiki session. I didn't even really understand what Reiki was. Um, I had had, I had had an experience previously with, with distance Reiki with my siblings. Um, but I was guided through a course of events and signs, right? The universe speaks to us in these signs, these great signs. And um, and so during that Reiki experience, uh, when I started to lift outside my body and then I sucked myself back in and then I was like, okay, let's see if I can do this again. And I started to lift outside my body again and suck myself back in. So, um, there are there are magical experiences and what i have come to know is that these five senses that we think are our only senses are all that are being allowed really through control of of keeping us small because we are so vast and so expansive that um, if we truly knew how powerful we were and how expansive we were um, we would we would not need this construct of contrast. So, um, so that was one spiritual, metaphysical, paranormal, whatever um, you want to call it, experience that I've had. Um, uh, more recently, post near death experience, I uh, was gifted the experience of one of my dear, dear friends who uh, transitioned. Um, we had met for brunch, breakfast. He was uh, in New York at the time, coming back and forth. He lived in Vegas. And when I had the the wellness center, he was one of the the people that came regularly to the wellness center and we became very close. And we were spiritual confidants. We would uh, mentor each other. And uh, he uh, had moved to New York and he was in the entertainment world. And um we had a lovely catch up, but I felt that, and again, in hindsight, it's amazing how you can connect these dots, but we had had this just extraordinary time together and it was just so full of love and appreciation. And, um, and then he said, you know, I'm going to be here a couple of days. Um, let's get together again. And so the next day I receive a phone call and, and I see that it's him and I'm, I am out for a walk and I pick up the phone and I'm like, oh, so quick, right? Hey, Rick, how you doing? And it was his daughter telling me that he was in, um, in the emergency room, but well, excuse me, intensive care unit at the local hospital and, um, and that he, uh, he was in a coma and, and I was, she said, can you come? And I said, absolutely. I hung up, I started running home and I stopped, I started talking to him and I could hear him. And I said, no, 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 no. Because as soon as I started that communication, I knew that he was already transitioning and um, no, 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 Rick, no. And um, I get emotional about it because it was so beautiful. He was in everything. I have never experienced this before, even within the near-death experience, because that was out of this realm. This was in this realm. And he was in everything. I could feel his energy in the air, in the trees, in the clouds. He was vast. And I could he was a dancer. He was a choreographer. And so I could feel him dancing in the extraordinary joy. And, um, and as it was washing over me, he, he said, I'm, I'm not coming back and I need you to help my family through this. And so we had a communication, uh, further than that, but that experience was just so extraordinary. And, um, and there've been many. So I, I, I just kind of want your audience to know that this is not for the special few, this is this is for everyone. Everyone gets to have these experiences. We need to remove the static. Uh, I, I use the analogy um, of a Peanuts character, Pigpen, who has all the, you know, the, um, 
what are like the dark cloud around him, right? The dust around him. That's usually how we navigate our, our lives. We have all this static and dust around us. We need to do the inner work to clear that so that we have a clear path to communicate with the creator of all that is and all the yumminess that comes with that. Oh, I love the way you describe that. It's so true. One of the best readings I ever did was on an airplane. I mean, one of the most, it was like that. I could hear the spirit for five hours. I did an episode about it. And the the girl who I was reading came on the show because we were both just like, what? Because <laughs> her mom came through and I'm, a, I'm yeah, me too. <laughs> I'm a professional medium and I can tap in, but this was like, and I said, there must be something about being up away from maybe all the static, as, as you said. So it oh, was so cool. Um, but yeah, so let's, I know that you have a book about it. So um, I don't want to, I, I don't want to um, go into, maybe we can not share all the, every single little detail, but tell me about the near-death experience, however oh, yeah. you would like to share it and, and what you learned. Um, yeah, it's, uh, how do I begin? <laughs> um, you know, like with everyone, there's a backstory, right? And we all have backstories. And um, what I have come to learn is that through the contrast and through the suffering, that's where we are able to make our way to understand more clearly the other side, God, spirit, um, and so I, I embrace and I, I appreciate all the suffering and it's not that suffering goes away or contrast or, or obstacles go away. It's how you navigate through those spaces. Um, but the near death experience itself came through an illness that, um, I had, and it was an upper respiratory illness. I will do a tiny bit of backstory. And that is that I was in a space of, looking outside myself for everything, for happiness, also blaming all the contrast, all the obstacles, all the drama and trauma in my life. I always thought it was external, that it was happening to me very much an energy of victimization, although I never spoke of it that way. And um, I grew up kind of with, with that phrase of, oh, poor so-and-so. So always elevating those who are in, um, in need or suffering or uh, low points in their life instead of really uh, uplifting um, and focusing on those who uh, were doing well. So it was kind of a program, right? My elderly mother was living with me. I was in a marriage that was challenged and um, I uh, had a very beautiful two-year-old toddler. And um, because my husband was had been in a major car accident and he was just suffering terribly, he moved away to go to a um, a ten day noble silence called Vipassana or Vipassana, depending on who you're talking to, um, in the pronunciation. And so he went to this ten day retreat, and um, and I was homesick. And I had already started to move away from taking antibiotics and things like that because I was always sick and I was taking antibiotics way too much. And it seemed like everything that came down the pike I got, and it's because I kept saying anything that comes down the pike I get, right? So you're affirming what you're, the universe is just reflecting what you're affirming. And, um, and so I had this upper respiratory infection that got um, even worse to the point where I was bedridden and I... I didn't know where I was. I mean, well, I knew where I was, but I didn't know if I had uh, the last time I had had any water or I hadn't eaten. And um, my mother was nowhere to be found. And I was getting scared because I, I, was, I couldn't take care of my son. And um, at first it was just taking care of his basic needs. And then it fast became, I, I couldn't even get out of bed or lift my head. So I started to get scared and and know that um, something was happening. And so I was able to grab my phone and contact my friend and ask her to come get uh, my son. And um, it's her, uh, my son's uh, godmother. And she came and uh, took him and she said, I'll keep him overnight. And with that, there was such a freedom uh, to be able to just release and let go. And that's what I did. I felt my spirit again, lift out of my body. But this time, it wasn't really me doing it. 
And so I just, or that I thought that I was doing it. And I just went and I was in the light. I was in this most spectacular light. It was freedom like I had never experienced. Um, I was expansive. I had no body. I was a sphere of light. Um, I was in the light and it was so bright. It was like uh, lightning strike white, I describe it as, just something so brilliant. And in that light and in that freedom was just such extraordinary peace and joy and bliss and expanse. And it was, um, it was brilliant. <laughs> and so I describe it as kind of a, what I felt was like a between place. So not actually all the way through, but um, I call it like the, the platform of a train station, right? So um, I was on the platform of the train station to go home, right? And to the light. And, and yet the feeling was also just exhilaration. Like you're excited to go on this roller coaster. And you've been waiting to be on this roller coaster and you go through the ride and the dips and the turns and everything was just so, you know, impactful and you got whipped around and it was fun, but it was also very intense on the body. And you're coming around through the last dip and you come into the platform and you're like, glad that was over. But, you know, super fun, a lot of contrast, don't need to do that again. And that's what it felt like. It was like the ride on earth was just full of twists and turns and it was fun, but I'm ready to go home. And then I saw, saw off in the distance, which is interesting because, you know, I didn't have a physical eyes, <laughs> but off in the distance, these two light beings, it was a sphere of light and then they morphed into a uh, human form the one on the left was more masculine form a little taller a little more um fuller uh and then the one on the right was a, a feminine uh smaller smaller form and they started to communicate to me uh, telepathically and that um and that i uh could continue on and to go home if you will or I could return back. And I didn't want any parts of returning back to uh, the physical form, but it was very apparent that these two beings had a job to do. Um, I, these were not beings that I had known. So they weren't like family members that greeted me. They weren't religious figures or um, you know spiritual masters, uh, but it was very apparent that I had some sort of connection with them. They They felt familiar, but yet, but not like um, just loving kindness in their communication, gentle, but firm. And, um, and so they had me go through what was a relationship review. So I know a lot of near death experiencers have a life review where they physically see their life like 360 degrees and all at once. Didn't have that. This was more of a, a, a feeling where each one of the relationships in my soul family would wash over me and I would feel the wisdom and knowledge and the yumminess of the experience with such appreciation of what the experience brought and just extraordinary love. And then as the, the fullness of the experience would dissipate, then the next one would come and wash over me. And um, there was no judgment. There was no attachment. It was just just wisdom and knowledge and love and beauty. And, and then my experience with my uh, husband would wash over me. That was one of the, <clears throat> the last ones. And we were very much in a challenged time to the point where we weren't liking each other very much and, um, and really moving through probably towards the end of our relationship. And, um, and so there was none of that in this experience. So there was none of the woulda, coulda, shoulda. There was none of the resistance. There was none of the judgment. There was none of, oh, what is he going to do without me? Uh, you know, none of it. There was just love and appreciation for this soul known as Jean-Pierre in the book. And then my son, 
was left to last and it felt very strategic that my son was left to last and the energy and appreciation and the love it was so much softer and purer and delicious and I just was so grateful that um, I opted for this experience to birth this being and and to be his mother for the short time that I was I was just so grateful and after that experience finished I was like okay let's go so any anyone listening to this who has a child or even a fur baby you know the experience of attachment right I was a complete helicopter mom I mean Shannon complete helicopter mom he is my only child and um you know very attached so to be in this experience where there was no attachment but the love was so much more expansive and extraordinary so what we think of as love is just a tiny speck it's really it can't can't even be understood because we have attachment with that love so the closest is the concept of unconditional love but even that doesn't touch this expansive love so after that experience and i was still saying hey let's go <laughs> right because i knew these two beings were my you know light ticket home and um and i was ready but they continued and said yes i have free will in this experience but um the being and the soul known as luke in the book um, would not be able to fulfill his destiny without uh his mom and losing his mom at such a young age and apparently he had done that in previous lives so um that it was something they wanted me to have all the information to be able to make the decision and so they gifted me really with the opportunity to feel the feeling of what this loss would feel to him and with that i i describe it in the book as shards of glass ripping through your soul and truly the first six months to a year after the near-death experience i couldn't even tell the story because i would break into a literal sob i mean the pain is so deep and anyone who has lost a loved one um, knows the pain the depth of pain of grief and um, you wouldn't wish that on anyone much less um, a young soul a young you know two-year-old and um and so with that i i um I said i'll come back and i will be this beautiful soul's mom until he no longer needs my support and um but i'm quite uh the negotiator and <laughs> and your personality does come with you by the way uh because my personality was fully intact and i said here's the deal i will come back and be uh this beautiful soul's mom and um and care for him and support him in all the ways that I am guided to. I will do the work of the light, which was also part of the deal, is that I would do the work to support humanity and uh, the work of the light. And I said, but when I'm ready to go, I get to go. And I get to go without any long drawn out illness or fanfare or, you know, when I get to, when I wanna go, I'm ready to go, I get to go. And with that, it was agreed and I was back in my body. And I went from, being on my deathbed, not being able to uh, lift my head to sitting square up, I would say, you know, in the high 90s percent better and different. So what I mean by different is that, first of all, I woke up saying, what the fill in the blank just happened to me? I was in a stupor. I was just sitting there staring at everything and everything had this kind of filter or actually that's even that's not accurate it was like beyond the filter it's like we live in the filter so it was just everything was alive and pure and vibrating and beautiful even everything that was inanimate like i was looking at the door and the hinges and the <laughs> doorknob with such appreciation uh 
that I, I there was like this residue left on me and I knew I needed to get some help. So I had, uh, I picked up the phone, I called my sister who had been studying meditation and really in full on practice uh, in, in kind of the healing arts and um, in her spiritual journey. And um, I picked up the phone and I called her and I said, Hey, can you talk? This is, I hadn't I had this fantasy of death. That's all I knew to call it. And um, I didn't have the, the vocabulary or the understanding of what was going on until that time. And then uh, she let me go through the story and she said, you had an exit opportunity. And she said, apparently we have many opportunities throughout our life to have an exit. Um, but you obviously were supposed to remember it for a reason most of our exit opportunities we don't remember and um and so she was very she, she's a leo she was very exuberant in her <laughs> experience and in her um expressions so um and i had just come back from you know touching the light and i was very very much in this otherworldly space so i said um you know let's talk later and i called a spiritual uh confidant another friend that um I really respect it, who is now um, transitioned. She's on the other side doing some amazing work. And um, so I called Brenda. She referred me to a spiritual advisor who then uh, said to me, you had a textbook near-death experience. Um, she described this residue that I was experiencing and she said, it'll last about two weeks. So journal it because you'll spend the rest of your life trying to get back there, which is so true. And uh, it slowly dissipated over a period of two weeks and um, and then came with it just extraordinary. Uh, um, some people would call them gifts. I believe that they are all part of our our uh, abilities and and our natural state. Uh, but that allowed um, communication with non-physical beings who taught me, guided me, supported me and um, continue with me today. Uh, and also uh, energy healing and other uh, expansive abilities that I use in my work today. That was so eloquent. And I, I'm imagining your book is a really great read because you're, you choose words so well. Thank and you. I have, I have a feeling you're a very good writer. So um, definitely Thank everyone you. pick up the book. I want to read it now. So I will. And um, yeah, that, that is absolutely beautiful. I loved the, especially the part about your relationship reviews um, because that's really what matters. I mean, that's really how we learn things. We don't learn things from inanimate objects. We learn things from the people that we encounter. So that's beautiful. And also to see the gifts in um, adversarial situations that we have with people. So we might create a soul bond with somebody to come in here and say, I'm going to mess with your life, or I'm going to make your life hell for a while, but it's all part of it. And I really, that does resonate so much as I sink more into this work and this awareness of how, when somebody does something or, or our dynamic is, um, there's friction. Now I don't freak out about it. I just say, okay, you know what? I thank you for that lesson. I release you. I still love you. I'm not going to engage with you anymore, but I also understand exactly why this had to happen between us. And I think that's really important to recognize that some of these people that we quote unquote hate, don't like, have issues with, they're actually part of the plan and they're actually in our soul family. So try to love them, try to find the love in your heart for them and, and, and wish them well and say, thank you. I'll see you on the other side. And we can recap, but right now I don't need this energy in my space. So that's a beautiful thing. You've teed up something I'd love to share. Please, um, please. Thank you for that because um, Spirit has guided me. Uh, I, I, I opened, Spirit guided me to open a wellness center. And I did that in 2009. And then Spirit started talking to me about going global. And I didn't know what that meant. And of course, my third dimensional self was trying to figure that out. But then Spirit guided very easily what that meant. And I moved into the meetings and events industry and I was told to teach on mindfulness. And um, so mindfulness, you know, I was called, Spirit called me an infiltrator. So I'm going to go in 
uh, working on stress relief, but what I'm doing is helping people get rid of that static so that they can have their own spiritual experiences. Um, but the key there is the mindfulness piece because mindfulness at its simplest form equals awareness, awareness of your thoughts and the world around you and non-judgment. So I'm going to say it again because it's a very powerful definition. Mindfulness equals awareness of your thoughts and actions in the world around you in non-judgment. So who do we judge the most? Ourselves. Everyone gets that. Isn't that interesting? Because everybody knows we judge ourselves the most. So we cannot expect anything in our external world, our sphere of influence, our family, our friends, whatever's going on in your world to change until we work on ourselves. So we have to start with the non-judgment of self and doing the inner work because as that changes, then the external world changes. And contrast, which I put this umbrella of everything that we don't want. So all the obstacles, all the dramas, all the traumas, all the arguments, all the things that we have in our world, um, in the duality of our world, I just put them all under this umbrella of contrast. It kind of diffuses that, right? Because the energy of, of the word, let's just say, um, you know, hate, right? Hate. You have an argument with someone, someone triggers you. All of those words, you can feel the energy of that. If I just say that's contrast, ooh, it, it goes almost to an equanimous state, right? So we look at things very differently in the work that I do. And um, and it diffuses all the, the energy around the things that we don't want because it all becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy when we are regurgitating over and over again the things that we don't want, right? It, what, what we resist persists. As you'll notice, I have all these like little catchphrases. So contrast brings clarity. So we want to really be the observer of our lives and understand that all the contrast that is coming is all just teaching us something to look at things a different way. And so you end up in time doing this work, looking at contrast in more of an appreciation instead of resistance. So contrast brings clarity and it is our biggest teacher. So if you are looking at your life and you are in the middle of drama and trauma and major suffering, I will explain to you that you are now in the participant stage. So you're leaning into it. You are the participant. It's like you are in the middle of the tornado. But when you are in mindfulness practice, you're the observer. So you see that I'm leaning in when I'm the participant and I'm leaning out as the observer. And when you are the mindful observer, you are able to then see the playing field and see how everything, you know, call it the universal chess game, like how all the pieces and the players are there for you. Things are not happening to you. They are happening for you. But when we're in the middle of it as the participant, we can't see that. But when we're the observer, we can see what's happening for us. Everything is a reflection of every of what's going on inside of you. Now, you had said something very important about, you know, the dyma dynamics of relationships. And I always use this parable. Um, you're in heaven, right? I'll air quote heaven because people have different ideas of what that is, right? Paradise, heaven. And it's, you know, 24-7 bliss. What could be better than that? 24-7 bliss. It's like that multi-million dollar view. Like you, if you're an ocean person, for me, it would be like this extraordinary uh, view of an ocean. You can smell the air. Everything is just perfection. But in time, what happens? You see that view over and over and over again, but in time, it starts to lose its value, its power. And so it just becomes kind of mundane and every day. So heaven is the same way, 24 seven bliss. There's no contrast. So it's just bliss and love and beauty, but there's nothing to learn. And so, Let's just say I'm in heaven and I'm like, I haven't really explored forgiveness. I'm thinking, I'm going to go back down. I'm going to go back down to earth and I want to explore forgiveness. 
Okay. So I meet with my, my uh, soul superior and we kind of kick around. All right. I'm going to be born a woman. I'm going to uh, live in a, you know, middle-class middle America home. Uh, I'm going to choose my mom and my dad. I'm going to choose um, certain key points where key people in my soul group are going to come and, and support me or be the contrast that I need. And we figure it all out broad stroke now because we're going to have free will when we get to earth, but broad straight, broad stroke roadmap. So I send out a telepathic message to my soul group saying, hey, anybody else that wants to go down to 3D land, have some contrast, meet me on cloud nine at the conference room, and we're going to work out the details. Instantly, we're there, whole, whole group of souls and a lot of murmuring. Everybody's excited. Oh, yeah, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm going to learn this. We're going to gain that wisdom, that knowledge. And um, and so I've decided that my key thing about uh, forgiveness is going to be an abusive situation. So I figured out who's going to be, everybody's kind of raising their, their proverbial hand, right? They're <laughs> going to, I want to be that. I'm going to come meet you there. I'm going to do that. And I'm like, yeah, but I haven't really, I need somebody who's going to be like the really most impactful experience, my abuser. And way down at the end of the conference table is a soul that I have had many, many lives with. Oh, They've been so yummy and so beautiful, our experiences together. And that soul's raising their hand. And they're like, I'm going to do that for you. So when we look at our lives, the individual relationships that are the most challenging, if we can come to a place where we understand that those souls outside of this third dimensional experience are the most loving souls giving you that contrast. It helps us with the perspective that this is what we came to do is understand contrast in this lifetime and get to the place where we no longer need the contrast because we learned the lesson. And we know that when we're not learning the lesson, things get louder, right? And it keeps getting louder and louder and louder until it, boom, it hits us in the face. And then either we're out cold, like we get sick, or we have a near-death experience, or something major happens. But if you reflect back and become the observer in your life, there's a really great book, by the way, called um, You Can Heal Your... I'm sorry. Of course, that one's a great book, too. Um, uh, Self-Observation by Red Hawk. Um, and in the link that I gave you, the Linktree link on my Amazon storefront are all the books that I highly recommend. And um, I know you're going to put the link in the description yeah. box. So um, the, the idea of reflecting back on your entire life is such a cathartic thing, but it's also so powerful because you see where the programs are. You see how you're playing out the same program with different players because you haven't learned the lesson. And it is one of the best gifts that you can give yourself. I, I, I tell this to my clients. I do a, a five, um, five week, five session package because you move through these five weeks and it is the most extraordinary gift you can give yourself to have self-reflection. Because then you're aware and in mindful awareness, you don't have judgment about it. You just see it for what it is, is a program, a pattern that can be changed. I could go on forever, as you know. Sorry, Shannon. I, like, Don't I, be, because I was so I, enthralled. I passionate. No, I was so enthralled that I thought, I don't even know what to ask because this is such good stuff. It's so <laughs> relevant to me right now. It's resonating so much. I keep thinking, okay, my whole life, I see what the lesson has been. And I keep doing the thing again. But just even with all of the healing, all of the self-help work, all of the self-awareness, I still feel pulled to kind of the free will that we have because that's why we have free will so that we can decide so that we can decide for ourselves. Do we want to go down this road again? Do we want to take a circuitous route? Do we want to kind of say, mm, this time I'm going to avoid that trap uh, because I know where it leads. And for some reason, there's some part of me that still wants to kind of get in there. Like I'm still kind of diving in. Like I know better, 
but I still kind of feel compelled to kind of keep going down that same road. And it always ends up the same because I know what the lesson is. I know, I know, I know. Well, a part of that is, um, so from zero to seven years old, our brains are in theta state. Theta state is hypnosis, as you know, you do, you do that kind of work, right? Um, so what is hypnosis when you're a child? Everything that you see, everything that you hear, everything that you engage in, you're being programmed for. So when we see that there is an aspect of our personality or, or our lives that we want to heal, whether it's relationship issues, um, financial issues, um, whatever they could be, um, if we go back to where we were programmed, that's where the healing has to start. And what happens is that we end up thinking that we're healing uh, like from 10 years ago, from a relationship of 10 years ago. But in fact, you're, you need to go all the way back to heal the origination point. And sometimes the origination point is ancestral, uh, generational, past life. And if you don't go all the way back to the origination point, some of my clients, I've had to go back hundreds of lives to get to the original point to be able to clear the energy all the way up to this point so that we could move forward and it's doable because um just like you know energy healing it's not bound by space and time so it can it can be done and then those who uh have not maybe had children yet who want to have children, we can heal all of that so that it, the buck stops here and wow. no longer continues for the next generation. So this is why, and I've learned this through my own journey and helping others, is we you can get some relief on certain things as you do certain healing modalities. But unless you go back to the origination point, it's like, it's like a, a weed that keeps growing. You pluck it, but it keeps growing. You have to get all the way down to the roots. That is just so beautiful. I am, normally I have questions. I'm just kind of, I think you just really summed it all up so succinctly, so eloquently. Uh, so I'll just ask you, what is it that the overarching thing that you want people to know? So first and foremost, based on the near-death experience, there's no death. Um, there's no attachment. And there's only love. So that's what I really gleaned from the near-death experience. There's so many things that, that I want the world to know. Um, that um, actually, I um, if I can do a little plug, um, I'm do. going to be launching my own podcast. It's taken me many years of spirit guiding me to do uh, a YouTube podcast. And I've gone kind of kicking and screaming because um, even though the work that, that I do uh, kind of forces me to be an extrovert, I'm very much an introvert. And so being in front of you know, doing podcasts and interviews and speaking in large groups or whatever, I always have to pray uh, ahead of time to allow my ego to take a, a backstage and let spirit just move through me because it's spirit who uh, is you're receiving the message from. It's not me. So I want people to know that um, that there's so much more um, than what they perceive. Yes. I love that. Thank you so much, Lee Papa, for joining me today. I, I'm. I, thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you for yours. I know that everything you said is going to be helpful to someone, if not everyone. Uh, and I really value your time and your energy and for showing up today and that you showed up today. Thanks, Shannon. Perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, oh, you're welcome. So